John chapter 17, as I said in the prayer, um, we see here in verse number 1, it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said. Now the entire chapter is Jesus Christ speaking. It's, the, it's every single verse, except for that first half of verse 1, are the words of Jesus Christ. And what he's doing, he's praying unto God. So we saw in chapter 15 and in chapter 16, Jesus is giving him warning. He said, I'm going to be leaving. And then he comforts them. He gives them the promise of the, of the comforter, of the Holy Ghost, saying, I'm going to be gone, but you're going to be comforted. You know, I'm warning you. I'm letting you know there's going to be hard times ahead. Don't worry. I'm going to send my comforter. I'm going to be with you. This all needs to happen. I'm letting you know in advance. These things are going to happen. You can be prepared. You can be ready for this. And now he's, he's basically closing up their evening with this prayer unto God. And this is a great prayer. We're going to go through this. There's a few main points and main themes of this prayer that we're going to get into. But um, we'll start reading here. He says, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. And pay attention to the way that Jesus is speaking to the Father, right? Um, he is speaking with authority because Jesus has authority as the Son of God, as God in the flesh. And it's not, I'm, and no, don't misconstrue what I just said to think it's like, um, what he said, the way he speaks is inappropriate or he's not like, um, you know, he's speaking with authority because he has authority, but he's not, he's not being disrespectful to God the Father in any way at all. It's, but, but the words that he says are bold. I mean, it's because he is who he is. And we see a lot of, you know, the deity of Christ in his prayer here. So that's kind of just, just pay attention to that real quick as we, go, as we go through the beginning part of his prayer. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh. So he's, he's talking about himself in the third person, that God the Father, you've given him, this, you know, me basically, the power over all flesh. He knows that he has been given power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. God had a job for Jesus Christ to do on this earth. He had a lot of work to do. He had to do the works of righteousness that end up getting imputed on our behalf at our salvation. See, not only does, does God wipe away our sins and, and, and forgive us of all the sins and the trespasses that we've committed, He also imputes unto us Christ's righteousness. And Christ lived a, right, a perfectly righteous life. He did everything right. He obeyed all the commandments. Now, we know that not all the commandments are thou shalt not. Right? There's a lot of them that are. There, are. there are what you might call the negative commandments, the ones that say, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, right? don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't do those things. But there's also plenty of other commandments that tell you to do things that you have to do. Well, Jesus did. He, did, he not only kept himself unspotted from sin, he not only you know, um, withheld any sinfulness and, and anything that would be thou shalt not. He, he didn't do any of those things. He also did everything they needed to do. I mean, loving his neighbor as himself, he did that. He did everything. He helped those in need. He, he went out. He preached the gospel. He did everything that he needed to do. All the positive commandments. Jesus did all of that. And um, he says, I finished the work. Everything you had for me to do now is done. And now is time's at hand. And, and you know what? This can be said about all of us. God has work for all of us to do. You might not know specifically exactly what that is, but I'll tell you what, I mean, it's not going to be any different than the words that are written in this book. Okay? We all have a special place, a special thing, you know, special abilities, you know, special uses, people to reach. We have work cut out for us. And when our work is done, that's when it's going to be time for us to go home, just as it was for you. Now, Jesus was approximately 33 years old when, when his life ended. And that's 
was God's plan. That is all the work that he set forward for him to do. We all live to various ages. You might live to be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100. You know, we don't know. But I, I strongly believe that if you are still breathing air on this planet today, God is, your work is not done for God. Amen. He still has something more for you to do. Don't ever get this mindset of thinking that no, no matter what your circumstances are, maybe you backside, maybe you get into a lot of sin and you're saying, well, I can't do anything for God anymore because I really just screwed up my life. Are you still alive? Mm -hmm. You can still be used by God. Now, maybe you won't be used in the way that he originally planned out for you. Maybe not. Maybe you have a, a young man and, and, and God wants him to be a preacher. And he ends up getting divorced and doing some things that just disqualify him from being a preacher. Well, God's plans can change for you. You can say, okay, well, you're not going to do that anymore, but guess what? I got a new plan for you. This is what I want you to do. And he's going to still be able to use you wherever that may be. So whether you get into sin, whether you just start getting old, whether you, know, you start losing your health, God still has a plan for you. And we can always take comfort in that. As long as you're alive on this earth, God has a plan for you. You have people that you can reach. And it's also, you know, a little bit of a, a warning in that as well because you don't want to just be brushing off what God has for you to do because he might run out of work for you to do. <laughs> and, and, okay. You, you refuse all these assignments well, you're done. Now, I mean, obviously, if you're saved, it, it, he has work for you. If you don't do those things, he's not going to send you to hell. But we don't, we don't want, you know, we ought not to be just wishing our life was over. You know, the Apostle Paul said it really well. He said, you know, to, to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's, it's a good thing, obviously, to, to, to perish in this lifetime and to go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't have the sinful flesh and everything else. Obviously, it's a great thing, but it's needful for everyone else that's around here for us to stay on this earth. There's needful for, I mean, it's needful for me. I've got a family to, raise, to, to, to run and, and children to raise. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we're not here to do that, who's going to do that? I mean, there's so many other people are dropping the ball already. We need to be out there doing the work. And, um, God has this work laid out for us. And, and, and you could always, no matter where you're at in your life, always say comfort. Am I still breathing? Am I still alive? Am I still functioning? Well, God has some more work for me to do. When you're done with your work, you, you won't have to worry about it. God will take care of the that God will take care of the rest. When you're done, say, okay. Don't even have to consider it. You look at the the um, Stephen was a martyr. Right? There's many, there's many men. John the Baptist martyred, right? Well, his work was done. He did what he needed to do, both of them. Their time was a lot shorter than others, but they stayed steadfast. They stayed in the faith and they, and they did what they needed to do all the way until the end. And whatever the end is for us, we ought, we ought to be doing the same exact thing. Jesus Christ did his work all the way up until the end, even when he's on the cross. Before he said it is finished, I mean, he's, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He did his work. He did everything he needed to do. Um, and he's, he's stating that now. He's saying, look, it's, it's, he's looking forward now to his glorification. Because he's saying, glorify me, God. You know, I, I, I did everything. And don't forget that Jesus Christ was a human being. He was God in the flesh. Yes, God. But yes, a man. He was born a little baby. He lived the human life. He experienced all the temptation that we experience, the testing, the, the trial, yet without sin. He went through that. It's, that's a great accomplishment. So he could look back and say, you know what? I, I did it all. It wasn't easy. There's a lot of hardship, a lot of trials, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of pain and suffering and everything else he went through and what was still yet to come. But he said, I finished the work. And that's a good feeling of accomplishment too. Just when you get, when you got a big job lined up ahead of you, and when you finally get that work done, you can look back, dust off your hands and say, man, that was such a sense of accomplishment. It gives you that joy. 
And this is a little bit of what Jesus is seeing here, because he's saying, you know, okay, you know, God the Father, it's time to glorify me, because I finished all the work that I have. And he's like, just like I've glorified you. I've been, I've been walking around this earth, I've been glorifying you, now it's time to glorify me. And look what he says in verse number um, 5. He says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So again, he's, he, he's completely understanding and stating that he was around. He was with God. He had glory with God before the world ever was even created. He's stating his own, that he's a deity, that he is God. He was with God. That's why it says in, in John 1, we covered this in the first week, but in the, the Bible says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus just said that here. I was with God. I was with you in the beginning, before even the world was. And I was glorified with you. And, um, you know, this, these verses are, are the reason we talked to uh, on Sunday. I actually had the longest conversation I probably ever had in my life with a Jew, an unbelieving Jew. And um, it's kind of tricky because he didn't want to talk at all at first. But I was trying to, like, I, I was being friendly with the guy. Look, I wanted him to be saved. That's why I was there. I don't look at anybody with disdain, like, when I'm at the door, obviously we're trying to preach the gospel unto him. Now, Judaism is a wicked religion that's sending people to hell, and unfortunately, that man is going to go to hell. Unless he changes what he believes, he is hellbound. But I was trying to have a conversation with him, and, um, and I was able to. Now, he wanted, every time I tried to open up the Bible, he was ready to end the conversation and shut, he was like literally about to shut the door. And this is why it's important, just take note, this is why it's important to have the Bible memorized, to have verses memorized, because there are people like that. They get scared of the Bible. They don't want you to open up this book. That can be a deal breaker. Just, by, just starting to turn the page, they get scared. He didn't want to hear what was in the Bible. So I said, okay. I told him anyways. But as long as I wasn't opening up this book, he must not have realized I was quoting the scripture to him because I was. I was quoting verses to him that he needed to hear. And one of the reason why I'm bringing this up is because he was trying to say, well, you know, you've got your belief and I've got mine. And, you know, I believe in God and what we believe is, you know, it's real similar. There's a lot of, a lot of similarities. And I said, yeah, but there is one very important difference. Because I'm not going to squabble about all the differences that there are anyway. Because there's a lot of differences, not just one. But what he needs to hear is faith in Jesus Christ. That's what I was ringing home. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go into all the reasons why they, their laws are screwed up and all these other things that they believe are messed up. Doesn't matter. He needs to believe in Jesus. And he was trying to say that. And I said, Well, look. I said, No. This is this is important. He says, Well, I believe in a Messiah, but it, you know, I, I, well, I told him. I said, You believe in a Messiah, but it's not Jesus. But I said, You have to believe that Jesus is Messiah. He's like, Well, but we believe almost the same thing. And I told him. I said, Yes. You, you may think that, but if you don't believe on Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And that's that simple. That's a fact. And um, I, I had to tell him that, because he said, well, you believe in Jesus and that's fine and you can believe that. And I said, well, wait a minute. Here's why it's so important. The things that Jesus Christ said, you can't say that he was a good man. If you don't believe him, he was either like a lunatic and just completely anti-Christ and anti-God, like a really, really bad man, or he was who he said he was. There is no middle ground with Jesus Christ. So I tried to explain it to him, and he knew that. But he didn't want to say that. He was an older man. I think he was 90 years old. And he says, I've, I've grown up this way. I've been brought up this way. I don't like to talk religion with anybody. But I actually happen to have about a 10 or 15 minute conversation with the guy. Thank God, uh, but I mean, who knows if anything sunk into his heart. But um, he said, this is the way I've, I've been brought up. This is what I believe. This is where I'm at. He's like, look, I'm 90 years old. I'm not going to change. I'm just like, you need to. You have to believe this because, you know, you can't say that Jesus was a good guy if you don't believe him. Like, you, he just said right here, these are the reasons why. And I wanted to show him this stuff, but he wouldn't let me open up the Bible. And I don't, I don't have this verse memorized. But um, there's so many. I mean, I quoted a bunch of them anyways. But he, um, 
You know, when Jesus Christ is saying that I was with the Father before the world even began. Okay. He's either the Son of God. He's either the Messiah. Like, or what he's saying is just total blasphemy and lies. And you could look at all the book of John when he's speaking about this stuff. And, and you'd have to hate him. You'd have to want to kill him if you thought he was a liar because of all the claims he made. He wasn't just another prophet. Oh, well, you believe in Jesus and I don't. Whatever. That's fine. No. You know, you shouldn't even be saying that. Like, like if you believe that, if, 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 I was, if I believed in Judaism, if, I, if that's honestly what I believed, if that was my true faith, and I was, you know, hopefully you'd be worried about other people. I don't think they are, though. Worried about other people going to heaven. Wouldn't you tell someone else, like, no, what you're believing is wrong. Jesus was a really bad guy. You know, you, 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 you should want to tell people, look, you are deceived, man. That Jesus was no good. But they don't do that. They believe that. They'll, they'll teach that in their synagogues. And they'll learn that and be taught that. But they don't go out and say that. And that's what a lot of Christians don't even understand. That that, that is what they believe about Dick. There's no way you could, you could think that Jesus was a good guy when you look at his statements if you don't believe what he said. If you don't believe he was who he said he was. And it's, it, I thank God for the Bible and for the things that Jesus said because we know that he's the Messiah. We know that he came. We know that he died on the cross and saved us from our sins and that he did all these great works and he did not mince words. Because some people like to say, oh, Jesus never claimed, you want to bet, anyone who says that Jesus never claimed to be like God in the flesh or the Son of God, never read the book of John because his deity of himself just claiming it and stating it is, is all over the place. That's right. That's right. Even Mo that Jesus said that too. So even, even Moses. You know, if you haven't believed um, Moses' writings, how should you believe my words? Because Moses spoke of me. Spake of me. But, um, so where are we at? Let's keep moving on here. Verse number six. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. And this is important too. Like he's talking and saying, look, everything that's yours is mine and everything that's mine is yours. Jesus is on equal standing with God the Father as far as power and authority. You know, like, obviously they're, they're separate, but they're one. We believe in the three in one. They are, they are unique. They're different, but they're still one God. It's, it, I can't tell you in full honesty, I completely understand that, but it is what it is, and that's what the Bible says. But it's interesting here, we're saying, look, what's yours is mine, and what's mine is yours. And he's saying, we're one, I'm glorified in them. But I like what he said here about praying for his disciples. He says, I pray for them. He says, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. Jesus cares about you as an individual. He's saying, right, he's like, I'm not praying for the world. I'm not praying for the whole group, for everybody. I'm praying for these guys. I'm praying for the ones that have stuck with me. I'm praying for the ones that have, that have been doing the work. I'm praying for them. All the more reason to um, make sure that you're doing what's right by God. If you want, you want to have someone like Jesus, you know, speaking for you and praying for you and, and looking at you and with that type of a love, you need to be doing this stuff. Abigail, sit still. He doesn't pray for the whole world. He's praying for the individuals. Verse number 11. He says, And now am I no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, this is one of the main themes of this chapter is this 
this concept of being one, where he says, I want them to be one as we're one, and um, we're going to jump down, so I'm going to cover this first, and then we'll skip over it later. We saw in verse 11, he says that, um, Holy Father, keep through that thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And this, this is really cool. We're going to jump down to verse 21, because he's asking the Father to keep to keep them, talking about the disciples, right? Talking about his believers, that they may be one as, as he is one with God, with the Father. Verse 21, jump down to verse 21, he says, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So now he's talking about giving glory unto his disciples. And he said, look, I, look we're, you know, we're one, and I want them to be one just like we're one. And this is, don't, don't skip over this. Look at verse 23. He says, I and them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved me as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So this, this concept of us being one with Christ is actually taught in, in other places of the Bible. Turn if you would, keep your finger here, obviously we're going to be coming back to John 17. Turn if you would to Colossians chapter 1. And that's a great statement. Don't forget, this is Jesus' prayer to God the Father. He's saying, look, I want them to be one with us like we're one. And having that type of a closeness with God, that being, being one with God the Father is amazing. It truly is amazing. And, and, and again, this is another thing. I'll be honest with you. I can't say I 100% completely understand this. Because it's mind-blowing for, uh, for me to think, how can we be one with God? You know, like God's so holy and perfect and true and and, you know, we're sinners and, and everything else. But don't forget th that we have that new spirit that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's born of God. As God's children, we have that seed of God's word that, is, that has given us life. That life that is in us is literally from God. God is our life. God is the progenitor of our life, of our spiritual life that's in us. And... What I think this is talking about is Christ in us, which we see, if you're in Colossians chapter 1, look at verse number 25. He says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So here we see the, the, the mystery, in verse 26 again, the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from generations is now made manifest to his saints. This is something that people of the Old Testament, people in the past had wanted to know about. He said, now it's made known unto his saints, unto the, unto the believers. He says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. So that, that same glory that we we're talking about, Jesus is talking about glorifying them in me, right? The riches of the glory of this mystery, he says, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is inside of every believer today. We have the Holy Ghost that resides inside of us. Christ is in you. That's why people will use that phrase. Um, I don't really like it. It's, it's, it's not really found in the, in the, in the Bible. We talk about salvation. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about believing. But when people say you ask Christ into your heart, which, I mean, Christ is in you. Christ is in your heart if you're saved. And, I mean, it's not like the, the, the worst thing in the world to say that at all. I, you know, I'm not going to give someone a hard time for saying that. I just try to stick with exactly, you know, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and all throughout the Bible. Just so that's really clear and it's, and it's directly coming from Scripture. But the concept of Christ coming in your heart is found throughout the Bible. 
And I think that that's what we see here with us being one with Christ. Christ is inside of us. Christ living inside of you, he's, he's, you know, one with you. I mean, you're one person. You're saying you're one person, you're one person, you're one person, I'm one person. But we have Christ in us for Satan. And um, also 2 Corinthians chapter 13 says a little bit more clearly. 2 Corinthians 13 verse number 4 says, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. So he's saying, look, unless you're a reprobate, unless you're rejected by God, Christ is in you. He's talking to church at Corinth, he's talking to believers. He said, look, unless you're just some reprobate that's in the church, Christ is in you. He's like, don't you know that? Christ is in you. And, and I like how it says there also you know, in verse 4, it says, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Um, God's power. God's one that gives us that life, as I mentioned earlier. And that's why it said in John 17, you can flip back to John 17, verse... Um, Three says, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Jesus is our eternal life. God is our eternal life. It's a, it's a, when we receive Christ in us, obviously Jesus Christ is life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when he comes inside of us, that is our life. He becomes our life. And that's why we have everlasting life, is because we have Jesus. Because He is life. And without Him, we don't have life. Without Him, it's death. We must have Jesus in order to have life. And um, just think about that. That, that. that is a comforting thing, to hear Jesus Christ. And He's praying in front of everybody. He's praying to God. But just hearing those, those words, that, that He wants us to be one with Him, the same way that He's one with God. He want, he, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. That's something that we should get excited about and that we should look forward to. But let's, uh, let's get back into John 17. We're going to go back here now to, to verse 12. We're going to skip over those verses and then we'll get to them in a little while. I just wanted to cover that because that that's talked about quite a bit about being one. And not only does he want us to be one you know, spiritually, but he wants us to be one in our faith. Right, and we preach on this before, on the unity of our faith. We should be, if we all have Christ in us as believers, we should all be lined up through God's word. We should all be in, in agreement and, and in one, one concord, one accord here, believing in Scripture and believing in the Bible and believing the same things. I mean, we really ought to be in unity and in oneness with each other and with our beliefs about God and about the Bible and about our doctrine and these things, because we all have the same God in us, and we all have Christ in us. And He's going to guide us into all truth. But we just need to make sure that we're letting Him guide us, and that we're not guiding ourselves or letting some lost person guide us or whatever. We need to make sure that we're, we're listening to the Holy Ghost and to, and to His words here. Let's keep reading here. Let's look at verse number... Um, well, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. I love this verse too because again, this ties in with the, uh, the eternal security of the believer. If we could do something to lose our salvation, that would be bad, really bad news for us because we probably would, right? If we had to, to rely on ourselves to keep us from the sin, from the evil, from all these things. But Jesus says, I have kept them. And this is what's important to point out to those who think you could lose your salvation. If, there, if it was just something that we can do, I would say, okay, yeah, sure, we, we could lose our salvation, right? If it was just based on what we could do. But when Jesus makes a statement like, I've kept them. Well, no matter 
how hard I even try, if Jesus says he's keeping me, guess what? Anything that I try to do against that is going to be in vain. Because I can't fight against God. I can't fight against Jesus Christ. If he's going to keep me, he says, look, I've kept these people. And God, now I'm giving them to you to keep. And he never says anything about forsaking those that he's kept, ever. That's why we believe you can't, that's one of, the, one of the many reasons why I believe you can't lose your salvation. This alone, and, and I've never really looked at this before as an eternal security type of verse, but it totally is. If Jesus is the one keeping you, man, there's nothing you can do about that. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? He, he, he's, he makes promises. He'll always be with you. He's given us the earnest of the Holy Ghost. He's in us. No scripture anywhere says him of departing and taking the Holy Ghost from us and, and breaking that seal of promise and all of a sudden, no, now that promise is no good. Nowhere in scripture does it say anything like, if it did, I'd believe it, but it's not found. People try to use logic and try to use their own, their own reasoning to come up with, with ways of how we can lose our salvation. But if Jesus is the one keeping you, my friend, there is no getting away. And that's what, I like the illustration. I've heard this used before, you know, because people always like using parables, right? There's nothing wrong with parables, but you've got to use them right. And you think about someone, like, holding your hand. Okay, now, um, because what people who think that you could, lo you could lose your salvation, they'll like this analogy, and they'll say, see, when, when you get saved, it's like you're grabbing on to Jesus' hand, you know, you're, you're with them, but you can just let go. Right? And you could just, just let go of Jesus and say, okay, well, I don't want that anymore. I'm done with it. But think about this. What if, because he said this, if Jesus is the one saying, well, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. You say, oh, yeah, but you could leave him. Because that's what they like to say. Well, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you, but you could turn your back. You could leave him. Really? Oh. If Jesus said that, that, you can't, that I'm not going to leave you, well, come up here, Brother Sebastian. So I'll illustrate this real quick. Just forsake, yeah, I'm not going to do the handshake around because I'm going to change it a little bit just to do the leaving or forsaking, right? Let's say that, that, say that I'm going to represent Jesus just for a minute. I know it's, a, it's, it's quite a stretch. And you're someone who's just getting saved. So like, you've gotten saved and you're here. And I say, okay, you know what? I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. But now let's say you decide to, to say, well, no, I'm going to turn my back on you. Go ahead and try to turn back on you. If I'm Jesus, guess what? Has he left me? Yep. Has, has he left me? Or am I still with him? He's trying to get away. Is he getting away? No. Is he? <laughs> because Christ said, Lo, I am with you even unto, unto the, the end of the end world. Of the earth. Amen. That's right. That's exactly what he said. And see, we may try to leave Christ, but if Christ makes a promise, he says, I will never leave you. Guess what? He's never going to leave you. You may try. You may turn your back and be like, I'm going to run. I'm going to make quick moves and try to get out of here. You're not going to outmaneuver Jesus. If he said he's not going to leave you, he's not going to leave you. That's the bottom line. It doesn't matter if you try to or not. He ain't going to leave you. He's right there with you. And with the hand-holding thing, it's the same thing. They say you can let go. But if Jesus is holding on to you, letting go isn't going to matter because he's still got you. And when you get saved, you are his purchased possession. You belong on him. That's right. He paid for you with, for your soul and with blood. You receive it as a free gift, but once you receive that free gift, you belong on him, your purchased possession. He's laid, he's put the inheritance of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. The, 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 excuse me, the, the, the um, earnest. I said the inheritance. The earnest of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's sealed us with. And that earnest is just that down payment because he's going to complete our salvation when we get our new bodies. And then we'll be fully complete with body and spirit and soul in, in, you know, in one. And um, so anyways, it's, it's all throughout scripture. It's very clear you cannot lose your salvation. I try, and it's the same way that, that we believe that God has kept his word. Because people like to try to tell you, well, look, you know, the Bible has errors in it because man is imperfect. 
man doesn't know how to, you know, man makes mistakes. Says, yeah, of course, man is sinner. You know, if it was just completely left up to man alone to preserve God's word, sure, there would be mistakes. I'll agree with that. But if God's the one keeping it, as he promised to do, he's the one that said that, that these words shall not perish and that, and that you know, one jot or one tittle shall not be removed from the law until all, come to, um, until all be fulfilled. He's the one that says that, that his words are like words tried in the furnace, purified seven times. You know, I, the, he's the one that promised to keep his words from this generation and forever. <coughs> he's doing the keeping. It's not man doing the keeping. That's why I believe we still have the very words of God, of Jesus Christ, today. Because God has preserved them. I don't have to rely on man to preserve God's word. God has done it. And God's the one that made that promise. The same way that God has pro Jesus has promised not to leave us, he's also promised to keep his word. He'll keep us and he'll keep his word. And that won't change. And he'll keep that for us. And that's why he's kept it for us today. It's, if, if it was just reliant on man, I would agree and say, okay, yeah, man's going to screw it up. But it's not. God has used man. God used man to deliver his word unto us. God used Moses. God used, you know, Paul. God used these people as the human instruments to write down his words. He's also used man to continue the preservation of his words. Right. It's not any different. Just because he used David to pen down some of the Psalms doesn't mean he's not using a scribe somewhere else to keep those Psalms word for word. Why is it any different? Why is it so hard to believe? Why is it so easy to believe that it's possible with David, but it's not possible with anyone else? That's the ridiculousness of the people who want to say, oh, the Bible is full. You know why they want it full of errors? Because they want to be able to change it when they don't like what it says. They want to be able to say, well, I don't like what that says there. That, that can't be right. I know more. And, I, and I'm sick of hearing these people that, that look at a Hebrew dictionary or a Greek dictionary and they want to go correct in the Bible. Yeah. When you add the group of extremely brilliant men who knew lots and lots of languages, a very studious effort that went into this translation of the Bible, put it in English, and they're just going to look at this and say, oh, yeah, you know, well, the Greek says this. They know nothing about the Greek. They've heard someone else say it. They've read it in a dictionary and say, oh, yeah, see, the, the, these translators got this wrong. Yeah, right. You look like a court jester in the presence of the men that did this. This, that, that had the, the knowledge and wisdom to be able to do this. And it's evident that this work had God's hand in it. You look at the fruits that come out of the King James, King James Bible. The fruit of the work of, of this book is unparalleled. The soul saved, the, the teaching, everything. All the, the revival has come out of this text. It's unparalleled. It's unmatched. You show me that these churches these days that are using all the new versions, the NIVs and the, the, the ESVs and all these other ones, they're dead. Yeah, they've got their mega churches with 100, you know, 1,000 people that go to them, but they're dead. They're not, they're not living righteously. They're living in wickedness. They're living in sin. They're not going out and getting souls saved. They're not bearing any fruit. No Christian fruit is coming from that, and they're all because they're being fed a bunch of lies. God kept his word, and we have it today, even in 2014. We have God's word because he has promised to keep it. Let's move on. Verse number 13, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not, that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And I want to pause on this real quick because I've been preaching lately about preparedness and making sure we're ready for hard times and knowing that that's going to happen. And I love going to the prepper expos and I love being ready for stuff. And, and, and I think it's just wise to, to have knowledge and skills and to be self-sufficient as much as is possible, right? But 
don't get so sucked into this mindset because some people do that. They, they, they take it way too extreme into thinking like, man, this stuff's going to go down. I need to be just way out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> with my own house and my own stream and, and I'm just gonna, I'm going to survive through this thing with my family. We don't want to have that mindset. You don't want to get overboard and just into thinking like, man, there, there's going to be a time when it's time to run, but things are going to be really bad at that point, and you're just going to be running for your life. And that's the only time that the Bible ever advises to get out of somewhere. Jesus says here, he, he already knows, he, he's telling them, or he's praying to God, but he's saying that the world hates them. And the world hates us. We're going to go through trials and tribulations and hard times. But he says, he says in verse six, uh, 15, he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. So Jesus' desire and his prayer for us is that we're not removed out of the world. He says, no, no, no. I want them in the world. He's just praying that God's going to keep us safe from the evil. So the solution for us isn't saying, oh, man, you know, the tribulation's going to happen, it's, and it's getting near, we just better get out of here so we can save ourselves. That's not God's plan for you. He wants you in this world. He has work for you to do. And guess what? Your work isn't chopping down logs so you can have a fireplace out in the middle of nowhere where no one else is. That's not the work He has laid out for you. You have work to be a light that shines in this dark world. That is your work. He doesn't want you removed from the world. He wants you in the world. He wants you right here so you can be that shining light. Other people can see that and that you can be a, do a work that's going to get people saved. John, um, look at verse number 18 of John 17. He says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. He's, he's, he's saying explicitly right there, I am sending them into the world. I'm not sending them out of the world. That's why he says, Go ye into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature in Mark 16. That was Jesus Christ's like final commandment unto the disciples is to go into the world. Not go out of the world. Go into the world. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 5. Keep your finger here. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our work. Go into the world. Mark, or Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That is our job. Hey, if you're saved today, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't hide your light. Don't let this world shut you down and shut you up and intimidate you and scare you into thinking, I can't talk about Jesus, no one wants to hear about him. Don't be that timid. Pray for boldness. Walk in. If you're walking in the Spirit, you will have that boldness. We are to be lights. He's saying, don't hide it under a bushel. Hey, if you're saved, you got that light inside of you. Don't hide it from everybody. Let it be known. That's our job. That's what Jesus wants us to do. You are to be in this world a light unto the darkness. And if someone else wasn't the light for you, you wouldn't have gotten saved. Don't be so selfish thinking that, well, I'm saved. I'm, I'm good. I'm just going to hide my light over here and then no one's going to give me a hard time. If you're a Christian, guess what? You're going to have a hard time one way or the other. One way, if you're doing that which is right, Jesus says you'll be hated in the world. Deal with it. That we already know about it. That's going to happen. But if you're not, if you say, you know what, I don't, I don't want to be hated by the world. I'm going to hide my light. Well, now you got God the Father to answer to. Because you're not doing the work that he had laid out for you to do. And I don't know about you, I... I fear the Lord. Jesus said, God said, not, you know, don't fear what man can do unto you. Don't, you know, don't be afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of what they can do. So I'm not going to be afraid of them. I'm going to fear God, though. I'm going to do what he wants me to do. And he says, let your light so shine. That's what we need to do. And your life will be, if you decide to hide that, 
because you're afraid of what this world can do. You're afraid of the hatred of the world. You're, you're afraid of the backlash. You're afraid of the comments. You're afraid of what me, people might think about you. Your life is going to be miserable. And at the end of your life, you're going to have nothing to show for it. Maybe you're saved. Sure, you'll go to heaven, but you don't do any work for God. You're not going to have any treasures up in heaven either. Don't let anyone intimidate you or, or cause you not to let your light to shine. So if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He sent us into the world. He doesn't want us to get out of the world. He wants us to be in the world because we have a job to do. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 19 says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servants unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law is without law. Being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this is the attitude that we need to have in this world. You've got people that have different likes, different tastes, different, you know, even religions. You want to be able to get down to their level. You don't want to just get out of the world. We need to get down to these people's level. Now, obviously, we're not going to do anything that would be sinful. And that's why it says... To them that were without law, as without law, I'm approaching them and trying to get to them on their level as without law, but I'm still under the law of Christ. I'm not going to be breaking the law in that sense. But you want to get be able to relate to people in this world in order to, in order to reach them, in order to reach them where they're at. And so he says to the Jews, I became as a Jew. You know, he, he, he was able to speak to them of things that they know about. And even when, when I go out and preach the gospel to people, I try to talk about the things that they're that they know and that they're comfortable with and, that, you know, and the things they like to, um, they know from the Bible or whatever, whatever their beliefs are, kind of use that to then show them the truth from the Bible. And I, in my example with the, with the Jew that I was talking to, I almost never bring up to anybody else, you know, that Jesus, you either have to say he was, he was who he said he was or he was a really, really bad man. I don't bring that up to anyone because... They're not going to get it the same way that someone who's a Jew will get it. Because that's where his belief is. That's where he's coming from. And those are the types of things that you might want to bring up to someone like that. And that's what he's saying here. Just, just you know, you got to get on their level to, to, to give them the truth. It's going to be more effective. Because you want to try to, you know, be made all things to all men. And you might save some of them as much as you can. And then... Um, even though we are in the world, Jesus wants to keep us from the evil of the world. And James 1.27 says, Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So even though we're in the world, all the more reason we've got to make sure that we keep ourselves unspotted. We need to make sure that we're untainted, that, that yes, we are living in wicked days, we're living in a wicked world, but we need to be that light and don't let that world darken our light and influence us to... Um, to start being spotted from the world. Let's flip back to John 17. We're going to wrap it up real, real, real quick. There's just a couple verses I want to hit real quick before we're done. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And this scripture just makes me think of what, you know, when Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Right? And that's what you're going to get from the world, too. The world, you have these agnostics, you have people who say, like, well, I don't really know what the truth is. And um, the Bible's really clear. Jesus is real clear. It's God's word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the word. God's word is truth. That is where the truth lies. Now, there's a lot of people that put so much em emphasis on their intelligence and their wisdom of this world and, you know, how many doctorates they have and all these other degrees and everything else and they kind of get puffed up in their in their knowledge now even that knowledge alone though is it's interesting because I, I just want to say I'm not against reading books at all reading books is great you can learn a lot I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that however 
every other book other than this one is written by a man. We know that this is the truth. This book is the truth. This is God's word. Any other book, what you're reading is just what some other man wants you to know. It may be true. It may not be true. I don't care if you read a thousand books, a thousand books from a thousand different people. Those are all books that one that each of those people wanted you to know. How do you know they're telling the truth? You know, I'm interested in history. I like reading this stuff. But to be honest with you, I have no idea if the things that happened a thousand years ago that I could read in a book today are true. No idea. No way of proving it. I don't know. How, many, how, much, how much literature has survived? How many of those people are all kind of in the same worldview, in the same mindset? Don't know. I mean, you, you hear that uh, you know, people who win the wars write the history. Right? They, they, they give their version. Think about, okay, think about this. Here's a better way to understand this. Because I thought about this. Think about all the books that are available today, like the political books and all these other things. You know, we have these John Hannity's and, and Rush Limbaugh's and all these other guys are putting out all these books, right? And today, it's easy for us because you hear them, you hear all these different things that they're saying, and you can say, like, that guy's a nuts. Like, like this stuff that he's believing and things he's saying, that's not true at all. But we're here. We're in the now. We're in the moment. We know you, you can know a lot more about someone, and you can say, yeah, that's not, yeah, but they wrote a bunch of books. What happens in 50 years? Hundred years, and those books are still around. And people get interested and they say, "Oh, I start reading this." Just because you read a book from a liar doesn't make you any smarter. This is archaeologically sound. This is this is sound in every way, every form that you could possibly say, whether it's historically, truthfully, accurately, archaeologically, everything. This is sound. This is the truth, and that's what that's the whole point is that Jesus said, "Sanctify them." Through thy truth, thy word is truth. We know that this is true. Any book that we read, the whole point of me get kind of going into that is just to say, the books that you read, they're not necessarily going to make you smart. And again, I'm not against reading books. But you don't know that what you're reading is true like you can know that this is true. This is our source of knowledge, of wisdom, of everything that's important in our lives comes out of this book. The Bible says... God forbid. He says, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Hey, every man could be a liar. Every man is a liar. Everybody is told a lie in their life. God's true. God's not a liar. And we have this truth. And man could be deceived and just pass along those deceivings in, in the form of a book. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.18, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. I'm not going to put that much stock in someone who's a really wise, you know, in the world's eyes, a really wise person, a really brilliant person. I don't care that much about what they have to say. Because what God said is that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. It's foolishness. That's all it is. People think they're so smart and God's like, you're a fool. You're a fool. You have no understanding. That's the way God views it. And guess what? If that's the way he views it, and these are his words, this is what I'm going to be focusing on. Last verse, John 17, let's look at verse number 20, and then we'll, we'll close on this. He says, neither pray I for these alone. Well, let's, let's jump up and do a couple other verses. Verse, uh, verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And God's word is going to sanctify, that word sanctify means it's going to set you apart. That is going to set you apart from the world. This word does that. God's word sanctifies you. 
It'll cleanse you and sanctify you and set you apart from the world. The world is all vainly, you know, infatuated with the, with the wisdom of the world. And God says that's foolishness. Read this book. This will set you apart. This will set you apart from the rest. This will sanctify you. But, um, and then he says uh, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray out for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You know what verse 20 is? That's talking to us. That's Jesus' prayer for us. He wasn't praying for them alone, but for them that shall believe through their word. We believed, not through necessarily the words of Jesus, but... I mean, through the words of people that were... It's, it's, let me rephrase that. We are saved by the word of God. But it wasn't Jesus Christ physically, audibly speaking unto us. It was other, other saved people going out and saying those words. And that's what he's talking about here, is that those that get saved from their words, from them preaching the gospel, from them speaking the truth. And if that's you... If you're, you know, you're saved, then Jesus is praying for you also. And this is great news. And this is, this is what I want to end it on, is just, is just on this um, believing on me through their word. God's design for people to get saved was for human beings to be his instruments to go out and preach the gospel. That's the way that he planned it. That's our job. God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to reconcile Sinners unto Christ. To reconcile men unto Christ. He doesn't come down and do it on his own. He needs us. He appointed us to do that work. We have the Soul Day Marathon coming up on Saturday. I encourage everyone to be a part of that. Because that is our job. And it shouldn't just be one day. It's not just one day. But this is a big day. We're trying to make a big deal of it. This is, <coughs> should be something that you do in every day of your life if possible. I mean, anytime you get the opportunity. We were just talking about this before service. You um, um, Brother Anderson here was, was at the barber. He's, like, you know, he's using that as an opportunity because the, he's got a captive audience. He's got someone he's got he's to cut his hair for, <laughs> for at least some, some period of time, right? Anytime you can, we want to do this, and this is what we need to do because people get saved through our words. It's through the Word of God, but we need to speak them. We need to say them. We need to tell them about Jesus and quote God's Word unto them. God uses us in that capacity to do that. And if we are silent, if we shut our mouths, if we don't share the gospel, then people won't get saved. Because God is not going to come down here in a physical form and, and give somebody the gospel that they might be saved. If you're not doing it, he won't do it. He uses us. That's why we need to, to be in the yoke together with Christ doing the work for him. Don't lose sight of that. Don't think, oh, well, someone else will just go and do it. No one else is going to do it. There's hardly anybody doing it today. The only people who are going out and trying to give the gospel to people are people who are lost and, and making people twofold more the child of hell than themselves and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and all these other false cults. And the, even the Pentecostals now are going out. Where are the saved Christians going out and preaching the gospel of Christ? The number one task that we can do with our lives is to win other souls across. That has the utmost importance. Think about the, the, that. That has more importance to the person that you're giving the gospel to than anything else in their life. I know my salvation has the big, has, had the biggest impact in my life than anything ever can or will. My soul being saved is the number one event. It's the number one event that happened in all of our lives. The day that we put our faith in Jesus Christ and received that free gift of eternal life. We need to explain that gift to others that they can receive that gift as well. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I thank you for this great chapter and for this great prayer that Jesus made, dear Lord, that we can learn from. And God, I pray that you would please stir up our souls, stir up our spirits, dear God. Help us to be bold, not to get pushed around by, by this world that, that hates us, dear Lord. But um, help us to take comfort in the fact that we know that it, it hated you first. So, of course, the world's going to hate us as well. You've told us happen. You've prepared us, dear Lord. I pray that you would please, now that we know these things, help us to be strengthened. Help us to, to go out and do these things, dear Lord, that we can be pleasing in your sight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.